Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we have with us Professor Jaydev Yangoda, who is a very well-known commentator, analyst of Sri Lanka, has been watching, monitoring, analyzing its various political and economic twists and turns. Professor Yangoda, good to have you with us. Thank you very much, Prabir, for inviting me. This has been a what I would say a remarkable elections in Sri Lanka, particularly with the earlier movement in 2022, which really saw a mass upsurge in Sri Lanka. And this election seems to have seen the marginalization of the two major political formations who have really controlled Sri Lankan politics. So when we were young, we, of course, knew it as Bandara Naike versus the, you know, the opposition, which was more supposed to be a West in West inclined and Bandara Naike and Sri Mahabu Bandara Naike later were thought to be more non-aligned in that larger context of things. But that's a really long time ago. And what now has, a, it has appeared it appears to us from the outside that this two-party domination is actually over. And though SLPP really was controlled by the Raja Pakshas for the last decade or more, that really this politics is now in this election shows that new forces have seemed to have come up. Of course, the victory of uh, the party, which was earlier the JVP, again, went into various metamorphoses, is now the ruling party or has won the election, the presidential elections, and has also appointed a small cabinet. But we have to see what happens in the general, the parliamentary elections henceforth. So when are the parliamentary elections now likely to take place? Uh, most likely the last week of November or early December. In India, as you know, we have the system where the prime minister is much more important than the president. Right. And of course, the US system is a president who is important. And then we have an intermediate scenario like the French, where the president and the prime minister both have powers, the president perhaps more so than the prime minister. In Sri Lanka, what is the current scenario? Is the president a much more powerful figure? Our system has similarities with the French system. Uh, okay. But at the same time, we have a president whose constitutional position is more powerful than that of the French president. So okay. we have this strange terminology in Sri Lanka to describe our system as executive presidential system. So okay. Under the executive presidential system, we have a prime minister, but the prime minister is not a very powerful position. Well, the president is the head of the cabinet, and uh, prime minister is uh, prime minister's powers are limited vis a vis the president. So, our okay. is an unusual presidential system, which is called an executive presidential system, but more close to the French model. So how do you see the victory of the MPP and now its leading figure, Disanayake, who's become the president? How do you see them, the new formation, being able to steer the ship of Sri Lanka, which is in difficult water still because of the kind of agreement Vikram Singh had reached with the IMF? and the kind of uh, financial uh, burdens that still are there on Sri Lanka, particularly the fact there are huge commercial loans that Sri Lanka has. IMF is, of course, a major lender. So is the uh, World Bank, the Asian Development Bank. All of these are main lenders. Of course, China is quite often berated as a main lender. It is not a very significant part of uh, the outstanding loans are with China, India has even less. So really the issue is what IMF will do because they act on behalf of the commercial lenders, which are the international banks, the international other uh, 
loan or lending institutions, which really survive on, shall we say, rent income, which comes out of the, the, the kind of interest rates that charge countries like Sri Lanka. Whoever who became the president on the, at, the, at the election last week, so the situation in Sri Lanka is very, very difficult and complex. As you very correctly pointed out, Sri Lanka is in a major economic crisis. Debt crisis is only part of it. To handle or to manage the debt crisis, the previous president has been negotiation with the I, negotiating with the IMF, and there's some you know an agreement. Now uh, Sri Lanka is still paying the interest, not the the capital. But after 2027, I think the real, uh, you know, the repayment of the debt will begin. So until then, uh, the situation would be not very bad. But the, the new president's challenge is something like this. The economic recovery program initiated by the Sri Lankan government with the help of the IMF has unfairly placed the burden of economic recovery on the poor and the middle classes through taxation particularly. So that has created a great deal of you know, social discontent in Sri Lanka that is reflected in the electoral outcome the other day. So the people expect some kind of economic relief from the government. So the, the present framework of the agreement with the IMF does not provide for that kind of a step. Therefore, one of the things that the new government will have, the new president will have to do is to negotiate with the IMF to enable the government to provide economic relief for the people without further taxation, without placing more burden on the people. That is a complex issue. But nevertheless, uh, that is the expectations from the people, uh, if uh, those expectations are not met, you know, the legitimacy and public support of the new government would be at risk. So that is why the situation has become a little difficult as well as complex. So do you think countries like China and India would be able to provide some support in this direction? We also saw that President now Dissanayake, who was at that time a leader of the uh, part of his party, uh, he was in fact in India. I think about four or five months back, met the foreign minister, the external affairs minister of India, Jay Shankar, and also Ajit Doval, our security uh, chief. So, do you think both India and China are likely to help out in some sense the Sri Lankan government at this stage? My sense is that the new president will seek assistance from both China and India. Uh, but uh, the relationship with India, economic relationship, has been, uh, you know, there has been a closer relationship over the past year or two. Uh, because the Indian government helped Sri Lankan government to, uh, you know, manage some of the difficulties. But there is a problem involved there. You know, there are geopolitical issues involved between China and India. So how the new government can deal with the two powerful states without getting into any of those geopolitical challenges and complexities. I think that is the key issue. But the Indian, even in the case of Indian investments to Sri Lanka, uh, there are some concerns in Sri Lanka about the presence of some of the big Indian companies in Sri Lanka's north. So those are uh, domestic issues, but I think the new president will have to 
sort out his domestic challenges as well. So the point that you're making is that the economic headspace that the Sri Lankan government has as of now is limited. And without yes. some support or some relaxation, there is going to be difficulty in maintaining at least a political tempo with which he has already come into power. To continue that, that will be difficult unless there is some maneuverability and some headspace that the Sri Lankan government can get on economic affairs. But regarding the political legitimacy, and that's really the other question that I have, the opposition to him, at least from the two major formations that existed, isn't there anymore. And if we look at what has happened to the Raja Pakshes, his son contested and he got something like 2.5% votes. So it does seem at least the Raja Pakshes are out of reckoning, at least for the foreseeable future. Though Bikram Singh and others may still have some, uh, some amount of weight in Sri Lankan politics. But do you see this as the end of the Raja Pakshes or do you think they still would be on the wings and can bounce back? And we have the Philippines example where Marcos' son has bounced back after 20, 25 years. Actually, that's what the Rajapaksha family is expecting, that someday they will get a chance to come back. But, you know, as you very correctly pointed out in your introductory remarks, uh, this election shows that Sri Lanka's traditional, three main traditional parties are in serious trouble. They are in the decline, actually. So what is what has happened is that two new parties have emerged as the two dominant parties. One is the National People's Party, its candidate for the presidency, uh, Mr. Anura Kumar Disanayake, had won the election. And the other party, that's called Samagi Jana Balavege in Singhala, SJB, or United People's Force in English, it's a breakaway party from the UNP. Actually, it weakened the UNP in 2020. But the SJB and then PP have emerged two main political parties in Sri Lanka. So the three traditional parties that the UNP, Sri Lanka Freedom Party, and Sri Lanka Podu Jana Peramuna, the Sri Lanka People's Front, or SLPP, it has also been reduced to the status of a small party. So what we have is that the traditional party system has also gone through a structural transformation. To what extent this situation will prevail until the end of this government's turn, uh, that is an issue that we have to wait and see. My feeling is that Sri Lanka can might continue to be a system where only two dominant parties will be the main electoral parliamentary actors. That's the SJB and then PP. Just for our viewers who may not be very familiar with Sri Lankan politics, the SJ, SJB, which you have just talked about, is led by Premadasa, Sajit Premadasa, who yes, was sir. is the son of the former of a former president who was assassinated, I think, in 1993. Right. And he is he is really in that sense a breakaway also from the one of the two major parties, the UNP. But he wasn't a major figure in the UNP. And it's after his breaking away, obviously he has gained credibility because the UNP has lost credibility. And right. Vikram Singh, though he did steady the financial ship, so to say, tided over the crisis of the state, which had completely collapsed during the 2022 upsurge. But he has also been, what shall I say, playing footsie with the Raja Pakshes. And without Raja Pakshes support, he would not have been able to run the last two years. So I do think that 
uh, Vikram Singh has paid the price for that in these elections. And that's what the figures seem to show. You are very right. Because the Vikram Singh uh, paid the price of his political coalition Rajapakshas as well as his close alliance with the IMF. <laughs> these two factors actually contributed to the decline or rather there is uh, you know unprecedented defeat of the uh, the UNP. But it's interestingly, Ranil Vikramasinghe did not contest the presidential election as a UNP candidate. Actually, he contested as a non-party independent candidate, hoping that he could bring in you know sections from the SJB and the SLPP to his coalition. And he managed to do that. Actually, 90-odd SLPP MPs left the Rajapaksha camp and supported Ranil Vikramasinghe at the presidential election. Even then, he couldn't get you know, uh, much votes that would have enabled him to actually have you know, actually, my I have the figures now. The percentage we got is just seventeen point two seven. That the percentage of votes he got, and Rajapaksha's son, Namal Rajapaksha, got only two point five seven. So for Namal Rajapaksha, that's Mahinda Rajapaksha's son, to become like Marcos in the Philippines, he has a huge mountain to climb because from 2.57% of wars to 50% of wars would be a really difficult target for him to achieve. But you know, there's an, another interesting point that came out in this election with regard to both Sajit Premadasa, that you mentioned Sajit Premadasa's name, and Anura Kumar Disanayaka, the winning candidate. You see, uh, this election exposed one of the major shortcomings of the NPP in terms of its electoral support base. In the Tamil majority areas in the Northeast, or the Malayhagar Tamil, that is upcountry Tamil community in the central hill country, and some Muslim majority areas in the eastern province, Anura Kumar Disanayaka didn't get very many votes. Actually, most of the votes voters there supported Sajid Premadas. So that is an interesting thing. So the one of the challenges that the new president, Anura Kumar Disanayaka, will face at the next parliamentary election how to address this shortcoming within a space of two months, right? Otherwise, he would appear to be a president elected primarily by the single voters. Well, well that's, that's a question I was, I was going to come to you for, because for most of us who don't know Sri Lanka that well, we have always thought that the JVP was much more rooted in the Sinhala majority community and did not have much sympathies for the Sri, Sri Lankan Tamil movements or the Sri Lankan Tamils were also alienated from it for various historical reasons. And I'm not going to get into that history. So do you think there is a possibility? And this really centers on the question of how you see the Sri Lankan state? Do you see it as a centralized entity or do you see it as a bit like the Indian scenario, not completely federal, but nevertheless with a federal structure which have the states, they have certain rights and so on. Of course, all of that is always contested by both sides. Do you think, therefore, that JVP's original position which was relatively more for a unitary Sri Lanka and also appeared at various points of time to be anti-Tamil. That's the sense that we seem to have here. 
and particularly with the kind of Tamil uh, secessionist movement that also was run by the Tamil Tigers. Do you think that, shall we say, distance has not really been uh, overcome in this election? Uh, that's a very important question uh, you ask, Prabhu. Now, NPP's challenge is something like this. Uh, they cannot win the parliamentary election comfortably either without the support of Tamil and Muslim voters or coming into some kind of pre-election coalition alliance or post-election coalition alliance with Tamil and Muslim parties. That is one aspect of the problem. The second aspect is this. In the past, the JVP stood firmly in favor of a unitary state. And they were also opposed to federalism as well as devolution of power. You might recall that in 1987, 88, 89 period, after the Interlanka Accord that introduced devolution and power sharing system in Sri Lanka, uh, JVP opposed to it. Actually, the second insurgency was centered around this question. But later on, what happened was there was a slow transformation of the JVP's position. Although they initially objected and openly opposed the provincial council system. About 10 years later, in the 1990s, they actually contested the provincial councils and became members, some of them became members of the provincial councils. So now what happened was over the years, they started saying that although we don't accept the Indian solution, we participate in the provincial council system. Now, the latest position of the NPP is that they will fully implement the 13th Amendment as it is in the Constitution. It is the 13th Amendment to the 19th Sri Lanka's Constitution that established the provincial council system for devolution. So they don't deny devolution. They don't deny the validity of the provincial, or at least political validity of the provincial council system. So uh, the problem is for the NPP is something like this. They have to still take a position before the Tamil people, before the Tamil political parties, is that they recognize that a devolution needs to be further strengthened. Although we have a constitutional you know, amendment and the current situation in Sri Lanka is that we have devolution. At the same time, we don't have devolution. The reason is that elections for the provincial councils have not been held, I think, for about five years now. So one of the priorities that the new president has and also her approach to give a positive me message to the Tamil people and Muslim people is perhaps after the provincial councils to take steps to hold the provincial council system and restore those constitutional structures of devolution. That is very important. And I hope Mr. President Disanayaka will take steps to hold provincial council elections as soon as possible. That will be a bridge building exercise with the minorities. A very important point that you're raising, that one of it is, of course, the linguistic rights, which in this case is of the Tamil speaking population. And there are two sets of Tamil speaking population as you are much more aware of than yeah, our yeah. Indian viewers would be. One is, of course, those who went later, whose also their citizenship rights were not there for quite some time, and the ones who speak Tamil but a much earlier migration, if you will. And then, of course, you have also the question of religious identities and where yeah. you have raised the Muslim 
uh, identity issue. And there again, they are in different areas. So they don't really overlap in that sense. JVP or the new party that I continuously have to look NPP. for. NPP. That this is, this has seemed to have fared a little better in the Muslim minority areas than among the Tamil minority areas. And I think they have taken a public position uh, regarding a secular constitution, religious rights, and so on. But with respect to devolution and linguistic rights, I think there is still a bit of, uh, or shall we say, lack of clarity, at least amongst people like us who don't follow it that closely, that what is the JVP's position finally going to be? Formal acceptance is one thing, but is the heart really in it? That's really the issue. And that is a more fundamental shift that has to take place from the original JVP position. So I think that's something we'll have to watch because coming from India, we think that these two things are very important to hold a nation together that a centralized monolithic structure of the kind, which European politics saw. And this, you know, that if we, since you are, uh, shall we say, a great student of politics internationally, you would know that the European national projects led to two world yeah. wars. And that is not something that is today feasible in the world. So anybody who wants to go back to those times is going to be faced with a rather difficult political situation. Sri Lanka, of course, has smaller problems than we have, but both in terms of religious majoritarianism, and that's the Buddhist majoritarianism in Sri Lanka, and linguistic majoritarianism. These are things which are also existing in India. Of course, we have a bigger problem because we are relatively bigger. <laughs> Therefore, the problems are also bigger. But nevertheless, the problems are of similar mm -hmm. kinds. So I completely agree with what you're saying, that this is going to be the test. And what you've pointed out is the test is going to come very close because we are going to have the, the uh, elections to the parliament yeah. soon. Yeah. So any last words you have to say with respect to how you see the people's role in all of this? Because let's face it, the 2022 upsurge, which led to finally the Rajapakshas being forced to flee, leave power, was a result of a mass upsurge. It was not led by political parties. It was really bottom up in a way that we mm -hmm. haven't seen. And it's very rare in international politics to see such a scenario. So how do you see that? And what do you think the people's, those two, those who came into the streets who fought for getting rid of the kind of authoritarian structure that the Raja Pakshas had. How do you see that playing out, the people's power playing out now as a check on the political parties and the leadership? Now, I want to make three brief points in response to some of the points you made. You see, the NPP is not opposed to either devolution or linguistic rights of the Tamil or Muslim people. Actually, they strongly support it, right? The linguistic rights and cultural rights. Uh, on the question of devolution, they say that they they don't uh, actually they will continue with the existing arrangements, but there is a demand by the Tamil people and Tamil political parties. The for the full implementation of the 13th Amendment. That includes giving land and police powers to the provincial councils. No government in Sri Lanka has so far agreed to give police and land powers to the provincial councils. But I'm not sure what position the NPP the new president's party has on that, but that would continue to be a part of the negotiations between the government and Tamil political parties. That's point one. Point two, that this presidential election and its outcome 
and the victory of the NPP and Mr. Anura Kumar Disanayaka becoming the new president marks an extremely important, historically important shift in Sri Lanka's structures of political power. And from 1948, and even you can say from 1931, when we got the universal adult franchise, until two days ago, right, Sri Lanka's political class consisted of the wealthy, land-owning, professional class of elites. It has been, the, even under democracy, the political power remained the monopoly of a small minority of Columbus-centric upper class, upper caste, you know, the small minority of the elites. But it is this election for the first time marked a decisive shift in the class nature of who governs Sri Lanka, who holds political power. So therefore, whether Mr. Anurakumar Disanayaka succeeds or not as a president, the fact that his electoral victory has this historical significance, his social political significance, I think is very, very important. That is also why the Colombo elite is very, very afraid and feeling extremely vulnerable when, you know, a, a, a coalition of subordinate social classes and its political organization became the new ruling class and the new ruling party. So at the parliamentary elections and also subsequent elections, and also within and outside the democratic framework, you can see the continuity of this conflict between haves and have-nots, elites and non-elites. That will be the defining factor in Sri Lankan politics in the years to come. And your other question about the Rajapakshas, return of the Rajapakshas, that is also linked to this conflict between the elites and non-elites. I think in that framework, the Rajapaksha's return, the, the prospects of return, so the Rajapaksha's would be not very significant. The more significant contradiction, more important, crucial contradiction that will define the parts of Sri Lankan politics, you know, since day, of, the day before yesterday, is this fundamental contradiction between the haves and have not seen Sri Lankan society, elites and non-elites, elite minority and the non-elite masses. So that has actually already begun to redefine the political tra trajectory in future Sri Lanka. I think that partly answers my question of how the those who shaped actually the movement and those who got rid of the Rajapakshas, that how will they enter the political arena or continue in the political arena? I think you've really answered that question, that that was the test that now the Disadaike and his political formation will have actually, to... Actually, this is the political culmination of the protest, actually. Protest. Thank the you protest very much, was... Professor Jan Guda, for being with us and giving us the various insights into different aspects of the transformation that has happened. And hopefully, we'll catch up with you in the future on the transformation as it progresses. And if it doesn't, even then, we'll have you as a commentator to talk about it. Thank you very much. Okay. And, you know, we hope that we will meet soon with what are the developments that are taking place in Sri Lanka. Thank you, Prabir. I'll, I'll be looking forward to joining you again for to continue our conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Yanguda, for being with us. And also, thanks to our viewers. Do please keep watching NewsClick and follow us on various platforms.